All right, we are live. Joining me today is a superbly special guest, um, Evan Thompson. Uh, Evan, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I wonder if you would say a few words about who you are and what you do for those who might not know you. Yeah, so thanks for inviting me to join you today. Um, my name is Evan Thompson. I am a professor of philosophy in the Department of Philosophy at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. I am also an associate member in the Department of Psychology in the Cognitive Science Group and in the Department of Asian Studies. And I work um, in cognitive science, philosophy of mind, also in cross-cultural philosophy. So I'm interested in philosophical issues about the mind and self and consciousness across different philosophical traditions, especially Asian philosophy and dialogue with Western philosophy. And uh, a lot of my work has to do with understanding consciousness. And some of it is in collaboration with neuroscientists, cognitive neuroscientists who do experimental work. And then, you know, some of it is in a more, uh, you could say pure philosophical vein. So that's in general terms what I do. Yeah, very cool. Um, I, I wanna say that I greatly admire your work. I, I think it's, and not only is do I admire the cross-culturality of it, which I wish there were more of quite frankly, but uh, I, I greatly admire that. The interdisciplinariness of it, scientists, philosophy, cross-cultural philosophy. But also I have to say something th that I admire about it as well is that how deeply personal it seems to you um, and the work that you do. You're not just, you know, exploring ideas for the sake of exploring. These ideas mean something to you and you and you're seem like you're personally really vested in, in getting to the, the right kinds of answers. And I, I think that's something that's missing in a lot of philosophical work. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think of that way myself and I'm, I'm glad that that comes through the work. I would say that uh, not in all of my writing, of course, but in some of my writing, I try to I try to give, you know, the, the personal context for the kinds of questions that I ask and the, the reasons I'm interested in particular things like dreaming, for example, in my book, Waking Dreaming Being, um, you know, there's, there's personal reasons behind that. And I think, I mean, I don't think that's like special about me. I think that's true for anyone who is kind of animated by a question or a topic. They have a personal story behind it. And I think, uh, I think philosophers should be more forthright about that. Or let me put it this way. I think philosophers should feel that they can be more forthright about that, you know, if, if they're so inclined. Um, yeah, no, I, I agree. And um, everyone, like you said, has that story, but often they get to sanitize their work and so to speak to make mm -hmm. it uh, sort of very, very official sounding or something. But I like the way you interweave that, that frame of that voice, but also the personal voice, you know, made with the antidotes and stuff. So uh, it was refreshing. I mean, that makes it nicer to read. There's a lot of arguments in there and that's great, but also there's some great anecdotes. So that's wonderful. Um, so, uh, you know, I personally in my background, it, as you might know, is in cognitive science and philosophy as well. I have less of a, um, a history in the Asian ideas. Um, I had a friend when I was younger who was raised as a Hare Krishna, but, uh, with a weird mix of Hare Krishna and, um, Rastafarianism. And so because of that, I read the Bhagavad Gita and, um, some of these other things, but I never really formally studied up as an undergraduate, but so I've learned a tremendous amount about these ideas and, I sort of wish that when my when I had my intro to philosophy class that they had had started with those ideas first because that's where all the consciousness is at. You know, yeah, you get to Descartes in, in Western philosophy and then sort of comes up, but this was already well established in the Upanishads and these other right. these other writings. And so I greatly I learned a tremendous amount um, uh, thinking through these issues. So I wonder if you could if we could start by saying if you could go through the the four kinds of consciousness that you kind of in your book Waking Dreaming Being where you say here's the four kinds that they have laid out and then use that as a framework for the rest of the book. So I wonder if you could say a little bit about that. Yeah, so, so what I do in um, Waking Dreaming Being is I take um, the, the classical Indian uh, map, you could say, of consciousness and use it to, to structure the, the organization of the book. And that map consists of distinguishing Originally, it's actually just in the earliest versions, it's distinguishing three modes or states. Actually, they're called three modes or states of the self, really. But the self is, is identified with awareness. And so one is um, waking awareness, which is, uh, you know, sense perception um, uh, with the senses key to particular kinds of physical stimuli. And it's also described in a way that has to do with the 
the you could say the jumpiness of attention that attention typically sort of jumps from one thing to the next sort of as we would say you know sampling different um, perceptual contents um, but it's also recognized that in the waking state um, there is a way in which the mind can wander away from what's given perceptually into its own kind of internally generated as we would call it today spontaneous thought processes or spontaneous cognition so that's the waking state and then there's the dream state which is considered to be subtler than the waking state where subtler means that the materials that make it up um, aren't outer sensory physical stimuli immediately but have to do with um, memory images memory traces and so the the dream state the mind is is kind of making up its own contents out of its own we would say kind of inner endogenous materials. And that's that's the dream state, very much linked to memory already in the uh, earliest Indian descriptions. I should say for people who might not be familiar with some of these historical dates that the the text of, well, the, the texts of the Upanishads um, contain a bunch of different texts from different time periods, but the earliest, the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad, which has this model of waking, dreaming and dreamless sleep, this dates from, probably, you know, 6th, 7th, 8th century BCE, you know, we don't really know the exact dates, but it's very early. And to my mind, it's like one of the earliest descriptions of what today we would call consciousness. And so the yeah. three modes that are distinguished are waking, dreaming, and then the third is dreamless sleep. Very interesting that this is singled out and described in a way in which there's no, um, no sensory or mental content in the form of say thoughts and images. And no, um, the text doesn't say this explicitly, but we could interpretatively say this, no kind of subject object structure. There's a, there's a kind of um, unity to the state, but it's described in a way that suggests a kind of sentience or awareness. It's described as peaceful, as blissful, as, as restful. Um, the, the analogy that's used in the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad is um, the dream state is like a fish swimming around um, or the alternation between waking and dreaming is like a fish swimming between two banks of a river. And then dreamless sleep is like the eagle that just like rests in its nest. It's not flying and it's just kind of watching. So there's this idea of a kind of awareness that isn't ordinary, um, you know, sensory, mental, active awareness. So those are the three states. And then in later texts, a fourth state is, or a fourth mode is distinguished. Um, and it's just called the fourth. And it's described either as just the kind of underlying sheer or pure awareness that characterizes all of these states in the kind of merry-go-round of, you know, going from waking to dreaming to dreamless sleep. Um, or it's, it's described as a kind of, um, state of contemplative realization or meditative realization, which is the, the sort of explicit lucid awareness of the nature of consciousness as just awareness different from the contents that make it up in waking and, and, and dreaming. So these are, these are very early Indian descriptions. And what I do in the book in Waking Dreaming Being is I take that idea of waking, dreaming, dreamless sleep, and then also amplify to include different kinds of you know, meditative states or or altered states of consciousness as we would call them. And I use that structure and I look at these different states from the perspectives of um, what we know in neuroscience and cognitive science today. And then what we can draw on from a range of different philosophical discussions, including Indian philosophy and also you know, contemporary philosophy of mind. And that kind of gives me the framework for that book. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's really interesting. Uh, one, th one question, I mean, I have a lot of questions that I want to ask you, uh, but one question that I have sort of off the bat is how we distinguish the fourth from the state in dreamless sleep. So I guess I'm having a little bit of trouble seeing what the distinction is supposed to be given the way you describe the, the, the kind of consciousness that's available there, a kind of just resting in place. But I guess it is there, it's not reflective or something so that in the dreamless sleep, it's not sure I'm not aware that it's awareness or something. So or I wonder if you could just say how we distinguish them. Right. Well, yeah, I mean, that's actually a really interesting question and it, and it opens up into a number of different uh, perspectives already within the Indian way, Indian ways of thinking. But um, I suppose a simple way to put it is that when we have 
this map that explicitly includes the fourth. The idea is something like there is awareness as such or consciousness in its kind of like ground state nature, um, which in the Indian metaphor is pure luminosity, pure awareness. And then dreamless sleep, dreaming and waking are um, sort of different states of excitation, you might say. So I'm, I'm kind of using an analogy from physics here. It's like you have a sort of like ground sort of state, zero energy state, which is just awareness. And then you have different states of activity or excitation where dreamless sleep is sort of the most minimally active, but it's still in a way active. I mean, in neuroscience terms today, we would talk about, you know, ongoing processes of memory consolidation and learning and things that are happening in, in the dreamless sleep state that are sort of cognitive processing. Um, but when the fourth is signaled explicitly in the model, the idea is that that's kind of the fundamental ground state or nature of awareness as such out of which these other three arise. So in a way it isn't really different from any of them fundamentally, it's that they are different activations of it, you might say. So what's interesting about it is it's a kind of flip from a, a, a one very received Western way of thinking about it, which is you start with, you know, waking perception is the model, the norm, and then like dreaming is an anomaly. So like originally when rapid eye movement sleep is discovered, it's called paradoxical sleep. It's like, wait, yeah, exactly. the brain is active in a way <laughs> that it's active in waking, but the person's like asleep physiologically. So what is this about? Um, and then we work from that into, you know, there are altered states of consciousness. And then what do we say about, you know, dreamless sleep? Well, the standard thing neuroscientists say is consciousness just disappears. So the Indian is almost, and I'm simplifying a little bit here, but it's almost like a flip of that. It's like right. the base is this kind of like ground state, zero energy state of just awareness as such. And then it, in its different levels of excitation or access activation has to do with the different kinds of contents it can work with, whether it through, you know, waking sense perception or through dreaming. And then in dreamless sleep, it's still, you know, it's, it's quieted down, but it's still active in a more minimal way. So that would be the way that one way to distinguish um, the, the fourth from the dreamless sleep state. Um, another way, which you were alluding to, and it's, it's interesting to ask parenthetically whether these are actually consistent with each other, but another way is, um, is in terms of, uh, well, in terms of lucidity. So dreamless sleep is typically not a lucid state. You're asleep, you don't know you're asleep. Um, there's a kind of ignorance, as the Indian philosophers would put it, that characterizes the state. Whereas the fourth, when it's described as a kind of state of meditative attainment or realization, is a kind of lucidity where you're able to witness the mind as it moves from waking into dreaming into dreamless sleep. So the dreamless sleep actually can become lucid. And then the question is, but well, wait a minute, is, is that like what, like what kind of meta awareness is that? Is it like a subject object meta awareness where you're aware of the dreamless sleep state as an object that can't be right because it's not supposed to be a subject object structured state. So there's some intensification of awareness that makes it lucid, but that isn't supposed to be structured in terms of subject and object. And this raises all sorts of philosophical questions, but on that way of talking about it, um, the difference between dreamless sleep and the fourth is that dreamless sleep is typically not lucid. You're, you're in a kind of like oblivion, but through meditative discipline, you can actually retrieve that that in awareness so that the state becomes lucid and it's that quality of lucidity that lucidity that is the fourth on, on that way of describing it um yeah I, I mean because one of the things i was thinking this it gets actually to the heart of what i was what my uh i mean obviously i'm, I'm extremely ignorant of all this stuff so i'm, I'm uh, probably stepping on there's probably many interpretations that people have thought through this a lot more carefully but anyway so one of the things i was thinking was that on one way of thinking at the fourth, it's like what's common between the other three. That's always there, but in the background or something like that. Uh, and But if it's a kind of meta-awareness that in, is involved with it, then it seems like that would be the wrong way of thinking about it because they're often right. not aware. So 
So do you think it's a mistake to think of it as the thing which is in common between the other three or is this a, because, yeah, so I'm just curious, is that a, a yeah. the wrong way to think about? No, I mean, the way that I'm inclined to think about it, so, so let me actually back up and say, there's the question of how to think about it in terms of the different philosophical and contemplative and interpretative frameworks that we have, you know, coming down through, let's say, you know, India, um, South Asia, um, you know, Tibet in a Buddhist context. So there, there's sort of the differences in that terrain on how this gets talked about and conceptualized. Um, and then there's, well, okay, what might we say today, given our situation of um, working both with these traditions, but also now with cognitive science, like what, 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 you know, would be the, would be the thing to say. And what I'm inclined to say, um, given our present state of knowledge, I suppose, is that there is something very attractive to the idea that there is a um, basic character to, let's say, sentient awareness that's present invariantly across any state of consciousness and that can um, occur in, let's say, a minimal form. So this has actually recently begun to be talked about uh, through the um, term or expression that, that Jennifer Vint introduced and that Thomas Metzinger has taken up the idea of a minimal phenomenal experience. So the idea that there's a kind of basic um, uh, core character to awareness and that it can manifest or occur in minimal forms where dreamless sleep would be a kind of candidate minimal form. And then if we could, and so this then becomes a research question from a, you could say the neuroscience of consciousness perspective or just the science of consciousness more generally, if we could actually um, characterize that or, I, or identify it more precisely, um, then we could use it to look at how consciousness becomes complexified um, in different, you know, animal life forms in, in different states of human consciousness. And if we could understand what the, 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 as it were, the neuronal signature of that minimal phenomenal awareness or experience is, then that might also give us a kind of purchase on um, something fundamental about neural processing in relationship to awareness. So I think that idea is, is quite, um, from a research perspective, is quite attractive. It's not to say it doesn't have problems, conceptual, philosophical, neuroscientific, of course, you know, like these are all working ideas, right? So we work with them, we, we see what we can do. But I think there is something to that idea. And I think that, um, that it's strongly articulated uh, philosophically in, in, Indian, in Indian thought and in a way where it gets debated. See, this is the other thing. It's, it's, it's that in the Indian philosophical tradition, there are a lot of debates around these notions. And so yeah. when we work through these debates, we can actually come to understand the, the pitfalls of thinking uh, in, in, this, in this area. And I, I think that's very productive for, you know, for research. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think that's a very interesting way of thinking about it. So the notion of the minimal phenomenal um, experience is does does that involve a kind of reflexivity on the way you're thinking about it? Right. So so then then there there is a debate which we see um, across Indian philosophy and of course in you know uh, in contemporary philosophy of mind about whether this minimal phenomenal awareness is reflexive, where reflexive means that there's a there's a there's a kind of logical um, self-relatedness where um, in experiencing or in being aware, there is an awareness of awareness, but it's not a higher order or metacognitive awareness. Now, some, um, 
some Indian traditions say, yes, that's the nature of awareness. It's inherently reflexive. And some say no and say, no, awareness is always of an object. And you're only aware of awareness if there's a higher order awareness that takes the first order awareness as its object. So they're like higher order thought theorists in our term. We see that debate played out. And it's not a doctrinal debate, which is interesting. So some Buddhists are reflexive theorists. Some Buddhists are higher order thought theorists. Some Brahminical Hindu philosophers are reflexive theorists, some are higher order thought theorists. So there's no sort of doctrinal uh, allegiance there. And then of course we see this debate in, in philosophy today. I mean, I, in my own writing, have, have argued on behalf of a, of a reflexive conception, drawing from Indian thinking, drawing also from phenomenology in the sense of, you know, Husserl, Sartre, Meloponti, those, those thinkers. Um, so I think, I think there's, there's something fundamentally important about that idea. Um, if we connect it back to the minimal phenomenal experience discussion, uh, I would say that that in the way that the concept of minimal phenomenal experience has been presented through my writings, through through Jenny Vince, through Thomas Metzinger's, um, treating reflexivity is a, a core characteristic of. Um, of minimal phenomenal experience, not like higher order metacognitive reflection, but reflexivity, sort of one order reflexivity. Uh, but open to someone to object and say, no, you know, minimal awareness is always um, of an object. And there's only awareness of awareness when you have some higher order process. And if I remember in his paper on minimal phenomenal experience, I think I'm remembering correctly. Um, if you're out there, Tomas, you can correct me. But um, I think what he says is that, well, what might be from the perspective of a phenomenological analysis, a kind of uh, non-subject object structured reflexivity could from the perspective of a neural architecture be implemented through a kind of um, uh, higher order monitoring or, or, or yeah. and in fact, that is his hypothesis now. So his hypothesis is that you have the reticular activating system sending a signal to the cortex. The cortex is trying to make sense of that signal. So that's a kind of higher order, like feed forward feedback process. And that's the actual architectural instantiation of what phenomenologically is a kind of non-subject object structured awareness. So it gets comp it gets complicated quite quickly, actually. Uh, when yeah, you're mapping these different pieces or or relating these different pieces to each other. Yeah, right. Because I I, I know in, in the book I thought that you presented a quick argument that you thought it should be one order reflexivity as opposed to the higher order one. Um, and am I right in thinking that that argument was largely phenomenological? Yeah, that it, it, yeah. that's the way it seems. So it sounds like what you're saying right now is that sort of, sort of puts pressure on your own argument. Yeah, so the arguments that I've given for a kind of one order view, um, they, they do appeal to, I would say, phenomenological slash conceptual considerations. Um, some of them come from Western phenomenology in terms of analyses of uh, time consciousness, say in Husserl. Some of them come from analyses of um, bodily awareness in Merleau-Ponty. Some of them come from Indian analyses of, of, the, of the nature of consciousness, but you could say they're all phenomenological in the sense that they're all analytically descriptive of how experience presents to experience. Um, right. And so I, I, I then think that it's entirely an open possibility to come in from the angle of cognitive neuroscience and say, okay, so that's the characterization in phenomenological terms. But now here's a model <clears throat> that is generative of that phenomenon. Um, and it is a model that consists in a number of uh, interrelated processes that uh, sort of feed forward and feed back on each other to put it you know, crudely. Um, the rub there though, is that you immediately in putting forward a model like that are in the terrain of the explanatory gap, right? So you always run up against the question of, okay, so here's the phenomenon, here's the model. And I'm saying the model is generative of the phenomenon, but in order to say that, 
I basically am ignoring the explanatory gap because the explanatory gap is not being closed in giving this model. So it's, it's, it's not actually generative in a, in a fundamental way. I mean, so, I mean, since I raised, raised him earlier and because our thinking is so close on this, I'll, I'll mention, you know, Thomas Metzinger again, you know, in his paper, Minimal Phenomenal Experience, which I think is just a fantastic paper. Um, he presents this idea of, of the minimal phenomenal experience having to do with a kind of reticular activating signal of um, tonic alertness and arousal that isn't really contentful, that then the cortex is, um, is trying to map and predict and make sense of. Yeah. And, you know, in, in terms of a neural architecture, that actually makes a fair bit of sense. Um, but then he immediately confronts the explanatory gap problem and tries to deal with it at the end of the paper under the heading of, you know, this is a physicalist theory. So how am I going to deal with the explanatory gap? He recognizes the problem, but as I see it, he just dances around it and restates the problem. And when, and, and he, he'll give a candidate answer and then he'll restate the problem and say, but there's still the explanatory gap. And then he'll give something that like purports rhetorically to be an answer. And then he says, but yes, there's still the explanatory gap. So, I mean, this is not a criticism. This is like, this is the state of affairs for, yeah. for the science of consciousness, right? Um, but I think that's indicative of, yeah, you can give a model, but at the end of the day, um, it, it's actually not truly explanatory. Do, do you think, I mean, I think that's interesting, but do you think that criticism applies to the one order reflexivity view or do you think it ev evades that? I think the one order reflexivity view as a phenomenological analysis is not in and of itself trying to close the explanatory gap. It's just trying to characterize the phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So it's not immediately subject to explanatory gap considerations until you raise the question, okay, and now how am I supposed to relate experience to um, one or another scientific model of you know, the brain or the body? Um, and that's when the explanatory gap happens. The explanatory gap happens when you're trying to relate, you know, models in terms to a characterization of, of the phenomenon. Um, right. So in and of itself, no, I don't think it does. But if you try to give an impl implementation of it, so if you're someone like a Uriah Kriegel or someone who thinks that there's, you want to explain in neural terms how this happens, yes. then you get the same sort and of immediately, problem. immediately, that's right. The immediate, immediately when you move from, let's say, descriptive elucidation or characterization of the phenomenon to explanatory modeling, then you're immediately in the, in the terrain of the explanatory gap. Um, another thing I would say here, and, and this differentiates me from, or it puts me in a camp that's different from, let's say, Thomas Metzinger and puts me you know, in the terrain of phenomenological philosophers like Dan Zahavi, for example, is that from the phenomenological perspective, that descriptive elucidating mode has a kind of epistemological primacy that can never be gainsaid or superseded by the explanatory modeling. Because in the case of the phenomenon of consciousness, consciousness, to put it, let's say, in the way a transcendental, like Kantian Husserlian philosopher would put it, consciousness is, is the sort of antecedent condition of possibility for anything being intelligible as a model in the first place, you know, for, for, for doing science, for there being observations. So the idea that you could sort of somehow step outside of that, get around behind it and capture it in a model um, doesn't make sense. Um, the, the, the phenomenon has a kind of primacy. And so the descriptive characterization of it then is not something less than or secondary to the modeling. It's something that's actually on, on, not just equal footing, but in a way I would argue has a kind of primacy, epistemological primacy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and you make this argument in the book too, I think. And this is, I mean, I guess I was going to ask something else before, but since you brought this up, I'll ask, I'll ask about this now. Because I think so, if, if one is interested in metaphysics and the metaphysics of the mind, and when we're trying to characterize your view, you say things that, well, you could say, okay, you're not an idealist because you explicitly, I think, disavow this idea that consciousness is, everything is consciousness. Right. Um, you, you seem like you're not a panpsychist because you don't want to say there's, you know, fun, consciousness at the fundamental level or something like that. You, you argue against physicalism for the reasons that you just gave. 
um, that, uh, you know, we can't reduce consciousness to any, any kind of neural activity because we understand neural activity from inside consciousness. So we can't step outside of it. Um, so what does that leave? Where does that leave you? I mean, right. so what <laughs> are you? Anyway? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a, that's a good question. So, um, so, so what I would say about that is that those alternatives that, that we just, you know, went through like idealism or, or one way of thinking about what idealism is, panpsychism, physicalism. Um, for me, they're all moves or, or positions on a board that's fundamentally structured by a kind of Cartesian uh, conception of the physical and of the mental, conceptually, where, where, where that means the fundamentally physical is um, exclusive by nature of the mental, the fundamental physical. Um, you know, the fundamentally mental conceptually presents or phenomenologically presents as exclusive of the physical. So, so when you have a board set up like that, um, I, don't, I don't really think you're gonna find anything satisfactory. So, so that's a negative point. To put it more positively, um, I, I don't really think any progress on these questions is possible without a rethinking of the nature of nature. So the way that we, that we think about nature is we think of it in terms of um, the physical as being fundamentally non-mental. Now, if we step back and say, well, wait a minute, um, nature is, you know, is what is, is the cosmos and different ways. investigating it where in that direction, um, then I think the metaphysical terrain starts to look differently. So this is, this is what, you know, a number of thinkers in the 20th century tried to do, like Whitehead tried to do this, Whitehead, yeah. Husserl tried to do this, you know, in different ways. And so I don't really think, um, there's any like forward movement on that question possible without really rethinking the terms within which we're working. So, I mean, I, I think of myself in a naturalist in the sense that, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not someone who would appeal to something outside this, the, the system of nature, if we wanted to put it that way. But I think we have to come to understand nature in a way where we don't think of it as fundamentally non-mental and then try to generate mentality from it. So that's where I actually think the panpsychists do have a really important insight. What I think they do is that the, then they sprinkle a kind of Cartesian mentality over, like, <laughs> I mean, the crude panpsychists, sprinkle a sort of pixie dust mentality over <laughs> mental particles and think, you know, okay, you know, the intrinsic nature of the fundamental particles is itself phenomenal in this Cartesian conception of the phenomenal. Um, and that doesn't really work for me, though I think they do have a basic insight, which is that, um, we have to rethink what it what it is for for something to be to be natural. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of that. I guess that's how I, I. I mean, that's in a way not satisfactory, but that's how I see the landscape. Yeah. There. I mean, so uh, yeah, because what it's it's hard because. What you're saying, like for me, it sounds a lot like what Galen Strassen says. It's close to um, Galen in some ways, yeah. And Galen's yeah. a panpsychist, though. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, of course, Galen is a panpsychist. Um, Galen thinks that panpsychism is also uh, the right way to be a physicalist. So, I mean, Galen's use of these terms is, uh, it's particular, right? He has a particular right. way of rendering them. Um, my, my view is, 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 is close to Galen's, except I suppose where I would maybe differ is that it seems to me that what he does is he thinks, so he, he works with, with the following ideas um, that, you know, that we see in say Eddington, you know, authors that he, that he, that he quotes, that he cites. And that is the idea that, um, that science gives us only uh, relational functional properties. Right. And 
consciousness we know from our own experience is intrinsic. Given that radical emergence doesn't work on his argument, that is you yeah, can't right. go from um, fundamental, fundamentally physical, non-mental to mental, where that means going to something that's intrinsically qualitative or phenomenal. Given that you can't do that, that we know there are intrinsic properties in the form of consciousness, that science only gives us relational functional ones, the way to solve the problem is to make the intrinsic uh, kind of categorical base of those dispositional relational functional properties, scientific ones, is to make that categorical base the intrinsic you know, mentality or consciousness. Right. Um, so that kind of argument I don't like. Um, I don't like it because I don't think that when we, I don't think the right phenomenological characterization of consciousness is to make it into an intrinsic property, qualia, you know, quali type property that is fundamentally different in nature from the relational configuration in which it's in, in which it's embedded. So that's what, that's a Cartesian intuition. It that's the Cartesian. Stuff, that's the yeah. Cartesian intuition. So he takes that Cartesian intuition and then he inserts it into the core of nature at the ground floor. Right. And so I don't, if I don't accept the Cartesian intuition and I think that science, um, I mean, one might raise a question whether that sort of structural realist way of reading physics is the right way to read physics. You could, you could question that too. If you're doubtful about both of those things, then you're gonna be doubtful about putting them together in the way that he puts them together. Mm -hmm. That said, I do fundamentally agree with him on the kind of guiding intuition that you can't start with a physicalist conception of reality and think that you're gonna be able to get uh, lived experience out of it in a way that you know, solves the explanatory gap. I mean, I, I do think yeah. it's right. In a way that differentiates so, me from say like Dennett, who was one of my mentors, who thinks, oh, there's no problem. Look, you just functionalize yeah. <laughs> it a little bit. And, and if you have a deep, I mean, De Dennett's not crude. Like Dennett's understanding of what functionalization is, is very sophisticated. Yeah. So, you know, his idea is if you really understand the functions, um, you'll see there's not a problem. So I actually don't accept that. Um, and that puts me, <laughs> you know, in sympathy with Galen, but I don't like the way Galen, you know, I don't like the furniture he works with. So I don't like yeah. then the way, he, the way he ranges it isn't gonna, isn't gonna work for me either. <laughs> so, I mean, is it fair to say that, uh, well, and maybe this, so maybe I'm misunderstanding you, but I wanna check. So is it fair to say that uh, the, the insight, you agree with them that you gotta have consciousness, you gotta read, think this term so that consciousness is part of the physical world in some natural sense but that whatever consciousness, it doesn't have an intrinsic nature. Is that the way to think of it? It's, it's kind of, is this the two sticks propping each other up kind of metaphor that we're supposed to be thinking about All here? Right. That, um, um, or is this something else that's, that's going on? Uh, it, that you wanna get rid of intrinsicality altogether. You don't think you have that even in deep meditative states or like the, the forest mm -hmm. is that a kind of intrinsic state, things of this nature, so. Right, okay, so here, here we, we, we get into what we mean by intrinsic. Um, what, I, what I was, objecting to was a Cartesian conception of the intrinsic character of consciousness. Now, whether, um, so, so that conception is that, you know, that there is an intrinsic, pure, phenomenal character to say the, the quaily blue that can be, um, attended to and isolated from its context of um, lived embodiment and environmental embeddedness. So, so that's what I'm objecting to. Now, there's a much bigger metaphysical question about, you know, are there intrinsic natures or is everything relational? Or are there intrinsic natures, but the intrinsic natures are a function of the relationality? Right. I mean, that's like a huge, metaphysical question that, you know, we see, you know, like in Leibniz and we see in Buddhism. And um, I don't really have a stand on that question, though I would say okay. my, my gut feeling is 
has always been a kind of, uh, how do I want to put this? Um, I've, I've always been by disposition, I suppose, this is not an argument. This is just like a statement of personal <laughs> autobiography. I've always been dispositionally inclined toward views that see um, a kind of interrelational monism or oneness as, as bedrock. Um, you know, we see this in thinkers like, in different ways, we see this in thinkers like Leibniz, we see it in East Asian forms of Buddhism, like Tiantai, Hua Yen, we see it in Taoism. So that, that kind of, um, the relevance of that here is just that the idea that you could extract something as an intrinsic nature that would be what it is independent of any relational framework, uh, I'm very dire suspicious of that. That's like a big question. Yeah, I appreciate that, but but yeah, one that does means, have... <laughs> I separate two things. Sorry, you broke up there for a second. Can what? Oh. You... oh, I just said I I I asked whether that made sense. Where what I meant was I tried to separate two things: the sort of Cartesian conception of the intrinsic nature of consciousness versus um, these bigger questions about you know relationality and in and intrinsic natures or intrinsic properties. Yeah. Yeah, I think that does make sense, um, and okay. it's it's useful because I think you know th this is one of the things that that maybe Galen and definitely some of us uh, um, more prominent and pan psychists like Philip Goff maybe and these kinds of people that's what they do is they say well introspection mm -hmm. reveals the nature of consciousness there's blueness I I just have access to it but I think one of the ways in which this maybe um, uh, comes into tension with some of the uh, some of the ideas from the Asian tradition is that well, that's a superficial level of awareness of consciousness and there are, there are deeper levels. And so if you really practice meditation and you attend to those things, then you see maybe they, they have, you know, they come apart. That's not the simplest thing. So there's a kind of maybe a mistake that's possibly made by simply right. taking kind of naive introspection. That seems to be the way you're objecting to what they're doing. That's certainly part of it. So, so uh, I would say that, you know, especially in Goff, um, you know, his idea that, um, that uh, I'm forgetting the exact terminology he uses. I think it's phenomenal transparency. Um, yeah. The idea that that the state in having the state and attending to it, its nature, <clears throat> its qualitative phenomenal nature, is fully revealed to you. Um, that that just seems to me fully revealed to you as just you know somebody sitting in an armchair reflecting in the moment on it. I mean, I, I see absolutely no reason to accept that. Um, um, I think, and, and here, I think this is a thought that we see in the, certainly in thinkers in the Indian tradition, but also we see it in, in Western phenomenological thinkers. It's like, no, that's just the bare beginning. You have to actually yeah. explore the phenomena. And when you do, you see that they actually have open, you know, horizons, to use the Husserlian term of, of interconnections and that they're saturated with different kinds of intentionalities. And the idea that you're just given in the moment something as uh, a, a pure instance of what it is, uh, I mean, that, 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 that seems to me to be, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be tendentious now. That just seems to me to be philosophically actually very sloppy um, and, and not properly aware of a lot of hard work that philosophers have done to say, yeah. no, you, you need to do a lot more than that. Um, I do wonder though, and I take that, I think that's a fair point actually, but I do wonder if there's not a, um, a version of this that you can recover once you've done the work. So is there no, you know, maybe I'm thinking of things like mind moments and these other things. Is there's no, like, once you've really seriously meditated, maybe even done dream yoga, once you've, you know, some people claim to experience the pure light of the fourth, once you get to these higher levels, so to speak, of, 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 of awareness, isn't there a kind of similar claim that can be made there that now you're seeing what it really is? I mean, isn't that the way it's often put? Yes, it is often put that way um, in, in a number of different Indian traditions. The idea is that if you have the right conceptual philosophical system and you have adequate proper meditative training that the phenomena um, in their nature will be, in their intrinsic natures, will be revealed or disclosed. Um, and then there are other 
systems and traditions that reject that and say, no, you're actually, when you think that way, you're in the grip of a kind of, to use the seller's expression of a kind of myth of the given that you think yeah. you've got hold of a kind of non-conceptual content that is, that's epistemically and metaphysically for, for these thinkers foundational. Um, and that is uh, mistaken because you are, you're, you're only able to make any kind of knowledge claim when you're in the, you know, in the ambit of a, or you're within the workings of a kind of, you know, conceptual linguistic system. So um, it's just to say that, you know, the terrain over there is as complicated as the terrain over here. And, you know, it depends, it depends. It's oddly comforting to know that actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we see the interesting thing to me is we see this reflected in contemporary debates among people who work with these traditions. So someone like Jay Garfield, you know, Jay, Jay is a Salarzian and his reading of, of Buddhist philosophy fastens on to the uh, traditions that are to speak in a weird anachronistic way, very, you know, very Salarzian. Um, and so, you know, his illusionism when he's arguing against, say, somebody like, like Goff or Strawson is coming out of that, you know, right. uh, Asian heritage, whereas other people um, will argue, you know, for something that gives primacy to, um, ex you know, direct experience, but now it's meditative direct experience. So my, my own, you know, my own position on that is, uh, well, I mean, my own position is it's complicated, but, <laughs> but um, I would say uh, I, I do think that working with a much richer spectrum of human experience is really fundamentally important when we're trying to understand consciousness. So things like, you know, meditative practices then become very important. But the idea that meditative practice gives you uh, a kind of observation that would directly determine theory, uh, I don't accept that because, I mean, observation never directly determines theory. Right. And the minute you start talking and characterizing what the experiences and observations are, you're already in the land of theoretical interpretation. So yeah. then it becomes back and forth between the two um, and, and, you know, what's most productive. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I was having the same kind of reaction when I was uh, um, you know, talking to Bryce Huebner a lot and uh, thinking about um, uh, yoga chara, is that how you say it? It's a yoga chara? Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. so thinking yeah, about their chara. ideas. Yeah. And I mean, one of the ideas that struck me was how do you know which is the illusion, the ordinary conscious experience or the meditative experience that you have? Because you're, it, it just seems that in both cases, you're applying concepts and, and, and the theory that you have pre-theoretically is gonna, or before that's gonna influence the way you come to it. So it, it, it's nice to know that these ideas are, are debated. And that's one of the nice things about, uh, um, about all these guys is they're very serious about it. And, but I do appreciate that a wider range of experience is important. So I wonder if we could sum this up by saying maybe what the moral from all this is, um, is that you know, phenomenology is important, but you're not, it's not going to lead you to any kind of metaphysics. It, it's hard to see how it could. Um, it's, it's not going to lead you to the kind of metaphysics that, um, I mean, I would say phenomenology is already, you know, metaphysics of a kind, but it's not going to, it's not as if you're going to do phenomenology and then you are going to um, extract a metaphysical system from it. Um, I mean, to, you know, to do phenomenology, you're already working with ideas of, of, of being, say, um, you know, very core metaphysical ideas. Uh, the very idea in, in say, if we, if we want to use sort of Husserlian phenomenology, that you shift your way of looking at things from sort of posited objects that you take to be independent of you. Instead, you're going to look at them in terms of their, you know, modes of appearance and givenness um, that's already a shift. That's a metaphysical shift. It's an attitudinal shift, but it's metaphysical because you're changing the idea of being from, you know, positive objective being to, you know, being within the sphere of, you know, uh, lived experience or something like that. So I don't want to say that like phenomenology is, is this area off cordoned off from metaphysics. 
it's it's you know it's it's saturated with metaphysical concepts but the idea that you would do it and get it clean and clear and then you would read off some other phenomenology especially i mean other metaphysics especially a kind of speculative constructive one right. um in the way that people say pursue physicalism and and panpsychism today that's that's not the right way to think about the relationship between the two yeah right yeah um yeah, I could follow up on this forever, but I'm mindful of the time because I, I know you have another meeting. So I want to make sure that we can talk about some other things here. But so one of the, I think you know, the core idea, I guess, of waking dream and being, and maybe some of your other work too, is to argue for a distinctive notion of the self. And, and really all the exploration of consciousness in its various states really is, is, is serving to bolster your conception of that. So as, as I read it, and as I think you've said pretty clearly, your idea is that the self is not an illusion. It's kind of a mistake to think that it's something that we enact, something we do, I guess, is what that means, um, a process of eye making. Um, and so I wonder if you could just say a little bit about why, uh, why it's, well, so I guess I'm more on the neural nihilist side of things. Um, and, I, and I really have a hard time uh, sort of seeing what the difference is between that kind of view and the view that you present, because to put it kind of briefly, it seems like what you're, what you're saying is um, it's a mistake to think there's this existing thing through time, uh, but there's still a process of that makes you think that. And so we should identify the self with that as opposed to the thing, uh, the entity. But isn't that really just granting everything that the other side wants there? I mean, so I, I'm a little bit confused about why you think this is uh, a, is it a semantic point that you're making or do you think that this is a more than a semantic point, I guess, a way to put the right, question. Right, right. Um, okay, so, so what I think is that um, th the term self or the concept self uh, is, is rich and multifaceted and, and can be used in a, in a number of different ways in philosophy, in psychology, and to think that its proper philosophical sense is an abiding, essential, purely mental, singular I is already to accept that the Cartesian conception of the self is the one that should be, you know, dictating the terms of the discussion. So if you if you start with that idea of self and then you know, you find that, well, there is no such thing that corresponds to it. There's rather this, you know, complex set of interrelated, you know, constructive processes. Then what you're going to say is, well, the self is an illusion, but it looks like there's a self, and at least under certain conditions, it looks like there is that kind of self, but then there isn't. And there are these just sort of processes that make up the illusion. So my objection to that is, well, that's one way of thinking what the self is. But if we look at the history of philosophy and the use of the term self, um, that's just a very, very limited and already actually in, a, in certain ways, tendentious use of the term. And so why should we, you know, why should we give the term self over to the Cartesians in that way? That's actually gonna force us to say that there is no self. If on the other hand, we, you know, use the word self in a much, um, richer to my mind way that acknowledges the different well that's fundamentally experiential so that self has to do with how we experience you know being a person having an identity being related to others and then we look at all the different um, forms that that takes and the different processes that make it up then what we're going to be inclined to say is that there are these processes of self-making as I put it and uh, a self is not separate from them um, the analogy I use is, you know, like the dance is not a thing separate from the dancing. So we're going to look at it in a processual way. And we can then acknowledge that some things in the, in the processes uh, going on can uh, involve, you know, different kinds of uh, illusions, we might say, um, cognitive, affective, perceptual, but the process itself isn't illusory and moreover the process is functionally important yeah. um and so is that a terminological difference well in some ways it's terminological i would say it's conceptual and 
that it's, um, I think, does more justice to the phenomenology than, than starting from the, the, Cartesian, the Cartesian starting point. I, I guess I would also say, so this is related to the phenomenology that if, if, you're, if you're a philosopher um, or someone who's studied philosophy and you've internalized a Cartesian way of thinking about the self, then you may think of self-experience as fundamentally a matter of, you know, I'm located here at the zero, zero point of coordinate space in my head, <laughs> looking out through my eyes, you know, that zero, zero, you know, coordinate phenomenal, uh, you know, convergence point doesn't change regardless of everything else that's changing. I mean, if you already are sort of in the grip of that idea, then um, when you start to look for that thing and it turns out, oh, wait a minute, you know, I can't grab hold of it, then right. you're going to swing to some kind of um, denial of it. But if you're actually, uh, I would say, more um, attentive to the different kinds of self-experience, and you're thinking along with, you know, philosophers like Merleau-Ponty who emphasize, you know, the importance of the body and the way the body is geared into the environment and caught up in, you know, networks of meaning that involve, you know, the contours of the landscape and interactions of other people, and you don't think of the self in this kind of intellectualized mental way, then, um, then you're not going to, you know, swing into the sort of, okay, what's, what's philosophically important is the denial of yeah. self and then, and then what? Then we have to cope with the illusion. How do we cope with the? How do we cope with the illusion? Um, so, so that's that's kind of what's going on there for me. So, yeah, you know, from some people's perspectives, it doesn't look like a big difference. From other perspectives, you know, that there is an important difference in terms of um, you know where we start from and the things we wind up saying. Yeah, I mean, I understand that, and I like that, and I, I mean. The thing I, I, I reacted to, well, the way I reacted when I was reading this, I was like, I agree with all this, but I think he's arguing that there's no self. <laughs> but, right, right. but so, so, I mean, so, because, but that's, because oh, I think that's indicative, just to interrupt you, I think that's actually, in, I mean, that's interesting and I think it's indicative. I think it's that because we're so in the grip of a certain way of thinking about self, a very like, to simplify a kind of like intellectualized Cartesian way of thinking about self, because we're so in the grip of that, um, we take that other narrative as showing what's most important is that there is no self. Um, but if we weren't starting with that particular uh, conception, it, it wouldn't present that way to us. Yeah, and I get that. And I have to admit that as an undergraduate, I was influenced a lot by Descartes. I think I thought I outgrew a lot of it, but it's probably pretty deep. But I, I mean, I sort of remember not being a philosopher, um, I think, you know, uh, before I went to college and was corrupted. Um, and I always felt like, I mean, if anyone were to ask me what the self was, I would say it's the thing which is the same. Well, I mean, it's the same, what makes it the case that I was the same when I was five and now. Um, now, is that an overly intellectualized mm -hmm. way I'm thinking? I think it's just sort of giving that ground for personal identity and saying, you know, when I say things like, I was the one in that picture, um, I, I want that to come out true. Um, and I, I think that in, uh, we both agree, I think that in neuroscience, there's, we haven't discovered any such thing. And, and in physical science as well, the body is not a good candidate for that. The brain is not a good candidate for that. So it, is that, you think falling into the same trap? Because certainly you agree that, or I may mean, I should ask, do you agree that there is no, this process is not gonna get that kind of personal identity, is it? If I upload to a computer or go into the transporter or whatever for these philosophical thought experiments, is, right. is it the same person that comes out the other side? That's kind of a question that this process and active view is gonna say no to, right? Right, right, right. So, so there, um, yes, I mean, when we think that way, you know, spontaneously as, as kids, um, we, we think in terms of um, an idea of identity or sameness, but then I think we also very quickly realize, um, well, but what exactly is that? Because, you know, I say it's the same river, but, you know, as kids, right. many of us 
realize, well, but it's also not the same river. Like, you right. know, so what's going on there? And immediately- we're all Heraclitus we're group, like, yeah. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. So immediately we're then in the zone of, you know, of philosophical thinking. And what I would say is that, um, you know, through philosophy, through, you know, other disciplines, anthropology, cognitive science, um, we can learn to see, for example, that well, maybe taking the pronoun I as a referring expression in that way is actually not the right, you know, not the best way to look at it. So, you know, in, right. in the chapter on self and waking dreaming being, I use um, an idea that Gennard and Ganeri uh, develops out of philosophy of language and also out of some, some of the Indian materials of thinking of the self as performative, that, you know, when you use the pronoun I, um, you're, you know, you're individuating yourself as a speaker, you're individuating yourself as a subject in relationship to others. And that right. process of individuation is part of the self-making process. So of course, you you know, you've got to learn, a, you know, some stuff about semantics and philosophy of language and, um, and cognitive psychology to, you know, to sort of describe it intellectually that way. Um, but when you do that, you get a perspective that in a way makes sense of that perplexing experience you have as a kid where it's like, well, I'm the same, but, but I'm not the same. It's like the river, it's the same, but it's not the same because it just is the flow. And then like, well, what is the identity of the flow? And, you know, so like that, that's how I, how I see that unfolding. Um, right. Intellectually, so, intellectually. I, I mean, but so I guess, uh, do, do we agree that phenomenologically we're presented as, though there is a continuing self? Do you, do you agree that's something that, that's phenomenologically present or do you think that's already over-intellectualizing it? Um, I think that sometimes, yes, uh, that is how it presents. And then I think sometimes it doesn't present that way. And then if you wanna ask, well, well, does it present more that way? Um, then I would say, Maybe, but we need to study that more. So, I mean, in the Buddhist context, the idea, or, or not just Buddhist, actually, you know, in, in Indian context across the board, right? It's a, it's a, it's a very fundamental thought that we are all of us habitually attached to or invested in the idea of a continuous, continuously existent permanent I, right? That is not how things are. And so, so that's an illusion. Um, so now is it the case, um, but, but it's important to realize that that's <clears throat> that statement. So of course it's a philosophical statement, but it's also fundamentally, um, you could say it's an ethical or soteriological. That is, it's a statement concerned with a conception of freedom and liberation, where it's axiological. It's the idea that don't identify with anything in the mind or in the body as self in the sense of a permanent abiding I, because whenever you do that, you will, you will chain yourself, you will be unfree, you will suffer, you will experience dissatisfaction, you will be miserable, and true freedom or liberation comes from freeing yourself from that. So that's a fundamentally like axiological frame, a normative brain, right? Yeah. So if we, if we then say, okay, well, descriptively, is it true that we human beings, we, let's even particularize it, we modern Western, you know, Western industrialized, rich democratic individuals, weird, weird, <laughs> yeah, weird. <laughs> do we habitually experience ourselves as having that kind of a self in say autobiographical memory? Um, I think in some ways, yes. And in other ways, uh, no, that is, I think many of us already as kids find ourselves in experiences where it's, it's obvious that that's not actually how it is. It's like, well, the I that I remember is a different I from the I that's remembering now. And the I that remembers now has to bring something back from the past, but it no longer exists, but I have to bring it back from the past given how I am now. Mm -hmm. And so it can't be that there's like a a constant core that it's more it's more complicated than that. I think I think that you know presents itself to many of us in in many experiences that that might then induce us into philosophy or induce us into meditation or induce us into yeah. psychoanalysis or you know like whatever it might yeah. be. So um, I agree, but I mean I guess I wonder if 
I wonder if in this instance, you know, uh, hard cases make bad law. So mm -hmm. in, in the typical case, you know, we have this experience and then there, I agree, there are these other kinds of, they seem like outliers though, in a sense. Um, and if, I mean, so whatever you think about that though, we, the way you're presenting it is that this, whatever you do have that feeling, it's incorrect. There is no continuous thing. So, so what, there's yeah. an illusion there. So, so what I want to distinguish is um, the axiological normative statement that there is a habitual self-identification and it's a problem and we're not free as long as we're subject to it. I want to distinguish that from a descriptive psychological statement that purports to be like empirically or descriptively true that right. that way of ident that that mode of self identification is the norm. Now maybe it is, but I don't want to conflate the two the two ways of talking because they typically right. are are conflated. Totally, and yeah. If it's descriptively true, so so if if it's descriptively true, the axiological framework doesn't follow. It's still a further question. And if the axiological framework is the one that we uh, accept, the descriptive statement isn't entailed by it as a matter of empirical fact, right? They're, they're two separate things that we have to that we have to distinguish. So what I object to, this is actually what I talk about more in my most recent book, Why I'm Not a Buddhist, is that I object to the conflation of those two things, right? right. Um, yeah, so, and it's a, in, the, in that book, actually, you argue that it's a mistake to say that Buddhism is sort of somehow uh, value-free or sociologically free, right. and but that that is what Buddhism is, that those, right. those judgments and normative dispositions are the core of the religious aspect of it. Right, exactly, exactly, yeah. So, but, 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 it, but, so you do agree. I mean, you do agree though, that that sense is an illusion and that it's a mistake to do that. But then you want to say, I mean, you say this at the end of the waking dream oh, oh. being book. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. You said two things there. One, that it's an illusion and two, that it's a mistake. So there, I, there, I want to make a further distinction, which is um, there may be an illusion in the sense that if we accept for purposes of argument that there is a phenomenal presentation of a self that has no existence independent of that phenomenal presentation, that has no existence in the way that it's presented, independent of the presentation. If right. we say that, it's a further statement to say that it's a mistake. Because the minute we say it's a mistake, we have to invoke you know, what the criteria of correctness are. Um, you know, is, is, is it uh, correctness? Um, I mean, it's a bit like colors, right? It's like, we see color. So the physics of wavelength doesn't give us statements about color. Does it follow that color perception is a mistake? No, it doesn't, that doesn't follow at all. Color perception is actually, you know, from an evolutionary ecological perspective, extremely robust and, and important. Um, so if we- if, But it's a mistake if, to think that it tracks some, some property in the world, which is like the color experience, uh, I'm I'm not even sure that that's true, actually. Um, mm. So, I mean, we reliably track environmental properties that we perceive uh, as colors, and so we're you know we're very well attuned and geared into our environment and having color perception. Um, the physics of light and surface reflectance doesn't give us statements about perceived hue in any you know, simple derivational or one-to-one -one way. Does it follow then that color perception is a mistake? No. Yeah. So similarly- No, I know, and you have a whole book defending this idea too. <laughs> right, exactly. So, I mean, similarly for the self, you know, it could be that um, the self is like color. You're, you're not gonna get statements about the self if you talk in the language of neurophysiology, um, or you know, cognitive neuroscience. Um, does it follow that it's an illusion or a mistake? Well, yes. If we if we if we accept the axiological frame, yes, of course. Mm -hmm. But then we've got to be clear that that's because we're working within that axiological frame, right? Yeah. So I guess because what I what I meant by a mistake was a, it's mistaken to think that it refers correctly. So I, I take the color experience point, but but I you know if you're familiar with this David Chalmers work like Eden. So it's a mistake to think that we live in Eden. So the color properties as they present to us are not like that out there. There's wavelengths of light that are out there, but 
And, and you may call you know objects red, but they don't have the property of redness the way it's presented to us. So it would be a mistake to think that that's the way the world is. The world is like colored in the way our experiences are, so to speak. Yeah, but there you agree you're with making... that? No, I actually don't okay. because, because yeah. there you're making a split between um, a kind of metaphysical realist conception of how the world is in itself independent of experience and then um, the, the domain of subjective experience. And um, for me, because, just because colors don't show up in the descriptions of, um, of fundamental or, you know, or macro, you know, macro physical descriptions, it doesn't, it doesn't follow to me that the world is not colored. I mean, the world is colored at the right level of description for the world, which is the world of ecology, of, yeah. of biology, evolution, and, and ecology. I, in my own view on color, I think of colors as relational properties that have to do with um, how the environment presents, given the presence of certain living beings who actually contribute to configuring the environment to be that way. So there's a kind of evolutionary, you know, co-evolution, co-determination. Yeah. So I don't think of color, I don't make, I don't accept that split between Eden color. First of all, I don't think Eden colors are phenomenologically accurate descriptions of color experientially. And I don't think that that's the right description for the, for the world to capture what, what color perception is. Okay. Um, so I would make analogous kinds of points for the self. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll retract the mistake part. So th there's an illusion there at least, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. You're, you're nodding. Good. Um, um, if, yeah. So, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, you go ahead. I mean, illusion, <laughs> illusion, um, Ill illusion is a tricky word, but if, If we describe the situation as, for purposes of argument, there's a phenomenal presentation of an abiding self, and there is no abiding self independent of the phenomenal presentation. So were we to take the phenomenal presentation as a presentation of an independently existing self, that would then be an illusion. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, and so, I yeah, this is, a, I see we're running out of time here. I mean, uh, unfortunately, there's so many things we haven't even begun to talk about. The discrete nature of conscious experience, near death, dying, um, <laughs> deep sleep experiences. So, I mean, I could hopefully maybe I can get you to come back someday and spend another hour with me. But just to finish up this, this topic, um, so you end, you, you kind of end the book by saying, look, I would sort of, if it were up to me, I guess my view would be that it's, it's, we shouldn't think of as enlightenment, or awakening or whatever you want to call it as realizing there is no self and therefore uh, that way, but to, to realize that there's this process that there is a self, but not to identify with any of its contents or any of any aspects of it in an overly particular way. Is that the right yeah. way of putting the, what you say at the end? Yeah, you could put, to that, put it that way. I guess the way I would be inclined to put it now would be to say something like, um, you know, there is an ongoing process of, of self-making and it's like a dance. Um, so there's no self separate from the process. There's no dance separate from the dancing. And then the question is, um, are we doing it in a, you know, attuned, sensitive, harmonious way that's, you know, geared into our environment and the world and others in, in, um, in, in, uh, I mean, and this is axiological now, of course, in a, you know, in a harmonious um, way conducive to our and others uh, flourishing, or are we doing it in a way that causes harm, um, suffering, pain, you know, think, things right. like that. that. That's how I would be inclined to put it. So, I mean, in that way, I'm a little bit more taken with, um, with ideas from, well, this is what comes to mind right now, you know, certain ideas from Chinese philosophy, from from Taoism, especially, you know, ideas of, of Wu Wei, of effortless action, of, right. of being geared into our world, our environment, um, and other people, you know, in, in harmonious ways. That, that would be how I'd be inclined to think of it. So it, then you'd say you, you would put less effort, uh, emphasis on uh, desire as a kind of source of suffering? Um. 
I mean, desire is unquestionably a source of suffering, but, but I wouldn't, I'm not myself drawn to those versions of, you could say philosophical ascetic thinking that mm -hmm. think that what we need to do is to extinguish desire or to, um, yeah, to eliminate desire. That I think is in the Indian context, that's an idea that's very much classically tied to asceticism and ascetic practices. Mm -hmm. And that's not a perspective that I find. I mean, historically, of course, I understand uh, the power of that way of thinking and where it comes from, but I don't find that particularly attractive for, for, for me or for, or for us here and now with the problems that, you know, that we human beings face. I mean, I don't, I don't think that path is, is particularly yeah, helpful uh, for dealing right. with our challenges right now. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I have a million other things I would like to talk with you about, I, as I said already, but I know, sorry, go I, ahead. I mean, I can go till about noon. So that's like another, what, 20, 15 minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you had to leave at a quarter till. Uh, I, I can go till noon. Noon should be fine. Uh, noon oh, okay. Pacific. I guess you're on the East Coast, right? Yeah. And whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Almost three. Um, okay. Oh, thank you very much. I appreciate that because I really am enjoying this discussion. Um, okay. So I wonder if we could kind of backtrack to, um, to talking about waking awareness um, and the idea that there's discrete moments, mind moments. Um, so you, you give, I, I, I've, I'm a fan of this. In fact, when I was um, doing my master's work, I actually I tried to investigate this and I was presenting, you know, two triangles that would make a square if you time it right. It looks like a square. If you time it differently, it looks like two triangles. And it mm -hmm. turns out that there's a kind of framework there, a time uh, a order on which people will perceive it as one unitary square. And if you adjust that, then they see that, that they're two separate triangles. Um, so I'm a big fan of this idea that there's discrete uh, moments. But you trace this back all the way to the Indian uh, way of thinking, to this uh, earlier way of thinking. So I one of the things that kind of was, I mean, puzzling to me was that you say that there's this idea that you can be aware of the edges, so to speak, in, right. in meditation, and also aware of the gaps. So this is probably a very novice question, but I was really trying to struggle to understand how there could be gaps and that you could be aware of them. And I know you right. say some things about it in your book, but I just was, I, I have right. some questions. So I wonder if you could tell us about it and then I'll. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's not a novice question. That's like a deep question that raises all sorts of issues about, about awareness. Um, so uh, on one way of thinking about what's going on, there's a kind of serial process of discrete uh, mind moments, as they would be called in Abhidharma, Indian Buddhist philosophy, discrete moments of awareness. And to a casual look, it looks like it's a smooth continuity, but to a closer analytical inspection um, with the right philosophical framework, um, what you have is, is a series of, of, um, of discrete moments. It's a digital, you could say, rather than an analog process. Um, and then what would it mean to be aware of the gaps? Well, on, on that way of thinking, you're never aware of a gap as such occurrently. You're only retrospectively aware that there was a gap. So in you other words, make an inference. You, make, you make in effect what's an inference. Um, um, you, you, notice, you notice a discontinuity retrospectively. And so you conclude, you infer um, that, that the process is, is gappy. Um, so that would be a kind of classical gap model. On some other models, there's at one level a kind of serial digital gap process. And then there's a sort of deeper architectural level that is able to notice those gaps. And so at that deeper architectural level, it could actually be gappy too. But it's moments of noticing if they line up with the gaps of the other can notice the gaps as such. So that's another <laughs> model. <laughs> um, and I mean, what, what's interesting about this is that, you know, the, these are these are theoretical models, right? So what's going right. on is that you have the Buddha's words, because the Buddhists are the discontinuous gappy theorists. You have the Buddha's words, and how do we make sense of them and interpret them? Well, he talks in terms of, you know, a collection of intermittent processes that arise and subside. So under philosophical pressure, um, the way to articulate that is as a gappy process. That raises problems 
you know, so how do we deal with the problems? Well, you know, there's a deeper level or we say it's retrospective. So it's to say that there's, there's like a kind of complicated discussion happening involving, you know, sort of textual hermeneutical interpretation of the Buddha's words, philosophical analysis under pressure of outside systems, innovation within the systems and, and, and they come up with different models to try to make sense of things. Um, so it's not like it's a direct readout of meditative experience. It's rather you got some I experiences, see. you got some text, you got some philosophy, and they're in the mix trying to make trying to make sense of things. I see. Okay, yeah. So in this in this other model where there's a kind of awareness of the gappiness or the gaps, I'm sorry. Um, which what kind of awareness on the model are we talking? Is it going to be fitting into one of our four things that we already talked about? Um, is it luminosity? Is it is it are you? It's, is there the gaps revealed in that sense, or is it another, you know, kind of yeah. awareness there? Um, so <clears throat> the 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 system of the four is a is a Brahminical, let's say, Hindu system. The gappy theorists are Buddhists, so they don't use that model of the four. But what they would say is that deeper level is is a distinctly mental form of awareness. So it's like a kind of <clears throat> um, it's, it's a mental cognitive level of processing in the system that's, that's able to, uh, to detect these gaps at, uh, at a sensory level, say. So you've got kind of like sensory perceptual processing, and then you've got a level of mental processing, and the mental processing is able to register, oh, you know, no perceptual signal, no sensory perceptual signal, a kind of a gap. So, so that's how they would think about it. And that description then makes the mental processing kind of like a higher order monitoring as it were of the, of the right. first order sensory level, yeah. Is there a, a kind of regress threatening here because aren't they also aware that they're aware of the gaps? Um, Yes, so I mean, then you get the then you get the question recapitulated at the mental level. You know, um, is this a retrospective inferential process? Um, I mean, if the mental process itself is gappy, how do you conclude that? Well, you, if you invoke another level, then you've got a looming, you know, sort of regress. So then this is basically takes you into the question: How is the mind aware of itself? And some right. people will say. Well, there's this inherent reflexivity, and other people will say, no, it's this, you know, higher, it's this like retrospective cognition that mental awareness of mind is always actually retrospective. So introspection is a kind of like retrospection. That's right. That's the answer those guys would give, those people, folks. I think uh, like William James said something like that too, right? Someone, yeah, someone in the West yeah. is. That's right. Um, James, James talks that way. Yeah. So I wonder so if you take this into the cognitive science realm, um, I, I know you talked about, I read this blog post that you wrote, uh, mm -hmm. so sort of citing some up, updated evidence for this. Um, I, I wonder, so I want to ask you about that, but I also wonder if you think there's any continuous processes uh, in terms of the brain, not sort of abstracting away from conscious experience for a second. And yeah, I don't know if you saw this recent trends in cognitive science paper uh, where they were um, uh, arguing that, you know, unconscious processes are probably continuous, but consciousness is discrete. Um, and so I wonder what just, you know, and they use uh, post diction as right. an example that shows this. So I wonder what you think about that generally, um, whether yeah. you think. Yeah, that's no, that's great. I, I have downloaded that paper and skimmed it, but I haven't read it carefully. So I probably shouldn't comment on that paper yet. Um, but, it, right. but it looked directly. I mean, I immediately downloaded it because it was directly relevant to this topic. Right. Um, I mean, so continuous discontinuous. Those terms aren't really meaningful unless we specify exactly in what way or sense we mean. I mean, there's evidence, there's definitely evidence for, um, I guess the way I would put it is that there's, there's lots of evidence that the brain is inherently rhythmic and that it has different, you know, different neural, different cells and different populations of cells have their own uh, endogenous rhythms and frequencies and so they have you know complex you know uh complex oscillatory activities how whether that translates into a perceptual process that's truly discrete that is that actually processes in terms of you know frame one frame two frame three um or whether 
there aren't temporal perceptual frames, but there's some, it's rhythmic, but there's some, you know, more continuous activity or whether it's perceptual frames and then there's a deeper level of a kind of more continuous rhythmicity. I mean, these I think are like, these are open big questions in, in right. neuroscience. Um, I, I think there's good evidence for uh, certain kinds of perceptual temporal framing, but it's not, it's not, it's not as if there's experimental evidence. There's, there, there's very, it seems to me, there's very little experimental evidence that definitively shows discrete temporal framing. That is, that can't be interpreted in terms of another model because there are very few experiments that are explicitly designed to test that. Uh, so, I mean, that's a long-winded way of saying, I think the jury is out on that in terms of the nitty gritty of what's going on. Um, at any level of processing in the brain, but I haven't right. read the latest trends in cognitive science article, so you know that maybe that'll change how I think about this. But but I need to read that one. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, all right. So we got just a few minutes here. I guess uh, I, I spend the last six minutes talking about death um, here <laughs> uh, because I, I really enjoyed the way you approached it. So first of all, I really like the reframing of the issue. Is like you know, near death experiences, the process of dying. Let's take a phenomenological approach. Let's let's understand that these may not be true, but they actually are just reflections of what's happening to the person. Let's take that seriously. And then I read your more recent paper as well, where you talk about this in terms of transformative experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I wonder if I could just get you to say a little bit about what you mean by death, because I know that's a complicated question already, and so you have a lot to say about it. But can you just tell us a little bit about what what is death on this view? Right, um, that's a big question. Um, yes, it's actually, six minutes. Chop, chop. Yeah, six minutes. Right? <laughs> it's actually the subject of the book I'm just starting to work on now. Um, so I'm working on a new book on that's tentatively called "Dying: Our Ultimate Transformation." Um, so it's it's on this topic. Um, I, I mean, what, what, what interests me in, in this whole area is the, the juxtaposition or the dichotomy between our increasingly uh, detailed, specialized biomedical knowledge of the biology of dying and the comparable lack of attention to and understanding of the phenomenology of dying. And I mean, I think this is symptomatic of big things in our, in our culture. Um, and so what I'm really trying to do is to try to articulate a framework where we can, you know, integrate these two things, put, put these two things into, you know, a, a kind of mutually informing dialogue with each other. Um, and so one of the fundamental points for me there is that science actually can't tell us what death is. Um, I mean, this is not news to some people. And, and what I mean by that is that what we human beings call death in the whole kind of cascade of complex processes that make up, um, that make up dying and, and then the state of, you know, dissolution and decay, what we mark as death um, depends fundamentally on considerations that are philosophical, ethical, social, um, and that science doesn't, you know, dictate how we do that. It provides relevant information, but it doesn't tell us how to do that. So the, so the, the more that we try to, as we learn more about the biology of dying, think that that's going to, as it were, tell us what death is, you know, more that actually increases our alienation in relationship to death and dying because science can't actually do that. We have to, right. we have to think about it philosophically. We have to think about it ethically. And then different, you know, philosophical traditions that are especially concerned with the idea that, you know, if you want to lead a full and meaningful life, you have to do so in a way that acknowledges the, the reality of dying and death. Those traditions become, I think, especially important. So, you know, those are traditions like Buddhism, um, contemplative tradition, Stoicism, you know, they, they're, they're ancient philosophy, let's say. The ancient world of philosophy was all concerned with this. And, and modern philosophy, for the most part, with exceptions here and there, you know, turned away from that. So, yeah. so what's at issue for me is really trying to integrate, you know, the, 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 the knowledge we have of, of dying 
as a biological process with a phenomenologically much richer understanding of what actually happens to people when they die, what happens to consciousness, what happens to their sense of self. Um, I mean, there's many different ways that people die. I'm thinking especially of people in our society who you know die at home or die in hospice. Um, right. that, that's, that's sort of what's going on for me in the terrain of the new book. So it's not as if there's, you know, the question isn't so much like, what is death? Here's the answer. It's, it's more, how do we understand this fundamental transformation that, that we all are going to undergo in one way or another? Yeah. I mean, so what, one of the targets that you have is the traditional, you know, annihilationist view of death. So it's, you know, death was nothing to me. Um, right. So I shouldn't be afraid of it, but, but I, th I think one of the nice points that comes out is a lot more complicated than that. It's really oversimplification. There's a whole process leading up to that point in time and maybe even continuing after slightly. I mean, I know you're, you, you're very carefully impacted the, the evidence for near death experience. I think you're right on about that, but there's also this, you know, it's brain activity persists after cardiac arrest for, you know, sometimes several minutes. We haven't really investigated that. So there's just a whole realm of things that we're that's not right. really clear about. I think that's, yeah, no, that's exactly right. So, I mean, um, from a biological perspective, you know, there are many, many different processes that make up a living being. They, they decay at different rates. Um, we don't know uh, what, you know, happens over different time courses in the brain in the dying moments. There's, you know, starting to be a little bit of evidence on that. There was a study that was just done by my colleagues here at the University of British Columbia that found in unresponsive hospice patients that they're still, you know, quite complex, sophisticated auditory perception going on, um, which confirms, you know, sort of what hospice workers and family members say, which is, you know, hearing is the last sense to go. From, you know, a, a Tibetan Buddhist perspective, there's actually a complex inner cognitive dimension to the dissolution of the sense of self in dying. Um, so, it, it, that's exactly, I think, something that 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 is really fundamentally important for me is that this this sort of inner life of the dying person, we we really don't understand that, and it's it's very important to understand that in relationship to the you know the different time courses of things biologically. In terms of like the metaphysical issues about you know um, annihilation versus like transition to another life. Um, it's not as if integrating the biology and the phenomenology of dying is going to be sufficient to answer those questions. Though, you know, those questions remain as philosophical questions, religious questions for some people. Right. Uh, I'm very, you know, attracted to an idea that comes from Zhuangzi, which is to think of death as transformation rather than as annihilation or as transition. Um, right. You know, annihilation is the sort of Epicurean idea that, you know, um, where death is, I am not end of story and yeah. the transition <laughs> idea is, you know, well, there's a continuity of consciousness and afterlife, however we're characterized. And the Zhuangzian idea is more, you know, it's part of a kind of cosmic turnover, a transformational turnover of elements. Um, and that annihilation is a biased way of looking at it. It sort of cuts things from a kind of artificial human perspective. So I, I like that idea a lot in thinking about this, but this is all sort of new work, new, new writing I'm doing now, yeah. Well, I can't wait till it comes out to get a peek at it. I, I know you have to go and I can't keep you any longer. So let me just say thank you very much for taking this time and talking to me. I, I can't recommend your work enough. If, if for whatever reason no one's checked it out, they should. It's thoughtful, thought-provoking, challenging in the best way. I think it represents philosophy at its, at its absolute best. Oh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I could not agree more um, that the way you approach these topics is a model for how people have to approach these topics. Not that they should agree with you or not, but that's just the right way to do philosophy, I think. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And thanks for inviting yeah. me. It's great to, it's no, great to no do this. problem. Yeah. All right. So I'll let you go. I'll end the stream. I'll say bye off the air, but uh, all right. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, and we are clear.